Hi, my name is Peter. I'm an emergency physician in Stockholm, uh, originally from Denmark. And um, today I want to talk with you about the concept of HALO, high acuity, low opportunity procedures that we in emergency medicine needs to be able to do, or at least know how to do. Um, most of these um, procedures will only be like a, a one in a, once in a career opportunity, depending on where you work. Um, but in most places in Scandinavia, Scandinavia, it will be once in a lifetime opportunity. But we are the per, uh, people who needs to do these procedures, and I'll show you why and how. Um, a conversation about HALO um, is always a conversation about how to practice, uh, how to become an expert, and how to do it in a wise way to have a system. So I'll also be talking about... Um, in the end of this lecture, I'll also be talking about how to um, a, few, a few teaching tips and how to um, teach halos and how to create a system so that we can become better at these, um, both these um, procedures, but also all of the other stuff that we want to learn um, on our pathway to expertise. So let's go into the lecture. Um, I've already talked a little bit about halos in these two lectures and several other lectures but this is a, a talk i want to give i want to give a total focus on the halo as a concept whereas in these lectures has been it's been a um a byproduct uh, of the lectures as always i'd like to give you some references um here is some good uh, articles and youtube videos on the halo concept Especially Cliff Reed has been really good in this space. John, uh, John Hines um, and Simon Carley have these great lectures as well, where he, where they go through. Especially John Hines's lecture is legendary within the foam uh, culture. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you haven't watched that, it's really really good. Um, I particularly also like How to Be a Hero. Not that we are heroes, but um, and Cliff Reed tells you that as well, but he he talks about this, these halo concepts and when we actually need to be brave enough to do them. Um, these really rare, rare and really intense um, procedures um, are of course also intertwined with how to perform in really stressful situations, and therefore there will also be a few things about that and here are some good references to begin with um, on on this topic especially at uh, Dan Dworkis's um, podcast and book um, um, which I've referenced referenced uh, later in the in the in the lecture it are really good references for that but recently there was a really great um, podcast as well by um, by uh, Rob Orman and uh, Scott Weingart about zero preparation um, uh, incidents. Uh, I think it was Rob Orman's stimulus podcast episode 111, uh, sorry, 115. I have a reference later on as well on that, on that. But yeah, and if you'd like visualization, um, then this Dan Walker's le lecture is, is a must uh, to check out. Okay. Then on the specific um, on the specific halo procedures, uh, which I will be talking about, um, I won't be going through all of the halo procedures at all. Um, you will have to read up on those yourself, uh, or you can go to my uh, Danish blog if you read Danish. You can go to my Danish blog where I've got done a long blog post on each procedure and how to do them. Um, but the references uh, are here uh, for each of these procedures. And more procedures, more procedures. And I think that's the last one. Okay, so what is a halo? Let's start there. What is a halo? And then, then maybe a bit about why is it important for us to know about this concept? So if we think about things that are, some certain things in emergency medicine are high opportunity, some of them are low opportunity. They only occur really rarely. Some occur every day or every week. And then there are some some things that are really high acuity, and some that are low acuity, meaning that some of our, some are really we need to know what to do before going into the situation almost, 
we need to know the doses we need to know how to handle the situation kind of performance under pressure non-technical skills all of that stuff these are high accuracy situations and then you have low acuity situations where you can sit down and think about it often talk a bit about a little bit more with the patient think out a strategy and so on and so forth so you make make call these hey ho high acuity uh, high opportunity this may be treatment of anaphylaxis. We need to know that by heart, how to treat that. But it happens quite often, so we get practice in it. The same with opioid toxidrome, where we get naloxone. You could also like, copy-paste any condition that you see often in the emergency room, like sepsis, um, low blood pressure. You can both have syndromes and diagnosis here. All right. And then you have LEHO which would be low acuity, high opportunity. I always put in atrial fibrillation, but it could also be vestibular neuritis or the DC patient, or like most patients that we see in the emergency department are high opportunity, low acuity, chest pain patients, so on. And you have low opportunity, low acuity. Uh, these are things that are usually not something that we need to do in the emergency department, but sometimes maybe have to. Um, it could be something administrative like um, like reading, like writing the death certificate um, for a patient, because usually patients don't die in the emergency department. They usually go to other departments to die uh, if they're palliative, or they, um, or they, um, they may like they may die from a cardiac arrest in the emergency department. That's a quite a rare rare event, and it's not too high acuity. It's, it's low acuity because it's, uh, the thing has already happened. But it's usually something that we need to know how to do as well. I've also put in like joint aspiration for septic arthritis. It doesn't help, happen that often, at least not in um, in our department. But it's something that we uh, need to do and need to practice as well. But then you have these halo conditions, high acuity, low opportunity. Things that are like we need to know them and we don't have time to practice. We don't have time to, time to YouTube the video. We don't have time to anything. We need to do it now and we know to need to know the cues when to do it. So why do we need to do it? Why can't the experts do it? Like usually all of these um, procedures there, they are actually, they usually belong, quote unquote, to another specialty. <clears throat> and I want you to get this concept into your head about these things, because I think it's so essential in emergency medicine when we are talking about why, who should own a specific procedure in medicine. I think that's nonsense. Like, if I'm a patient, I want the best person to do the procedure, and the best person is almost always the expert because we don't we, we have time to get an expert. But in the um, but in the in, a few instances where we don't have time to get an expert, then I want the best one in the room to do that. And the problem is, if it's not the best one in the room who does it, and we wait for the expert, then the condition that I'm like I need treatment for, the reversibility of it may expire. So we assume that it's like in the halo concept, we assume that it's better for the best person in the room to to do the procedure than to inadvertently wait too long for an expert to perform the procedure. That's like the essence of it. And when we talk about, for instance, should emergency physicians do intubation? I've, I posted my, I've, I've talked about my opinion in that matter uh, several times in different videos and in blog posts and in podcasts. Uh, and my, I, my opinion, um, like logically, I don't think we need to in Scandinavia because there are experts that are doing this every day and are better than we are, are getting more practice than we are. Um, we should know about the procedure. We should know about how to perform it um, so that we in an emergency situation can have an inf informed, informed conversation with our colleagues that may not know about the hop killers or may not know about other stuff when it comes to the resuscitation room because it's not necessarily there they have their practice they may be in the operating room and operating theater where it's a different environment so we need to be experts at that anyway but we maybe don't need to drill all the procedures the procedural skills in scandinavia 
because I think we don't need to do them in most senders at least. There might be some senders where there's the experience is too far away and that's fine. Um, but I think we need to have this mindset. We don't th have to think about, oh, this procedure or that procedure. We need to think about the mindset. What is it we want as patients? We want the best person who can do it within a reasonable time frame on, uh, before the condition is uh, like irreversible. That is what we want. And sometimes we don't have time enough for the expert to come. All of these procedures in the emergency room, that's what we as emergency physicians, physicians also need to be able to do to save life, limbs, and eyesight. Okay, so why, have a, why do I have a bridge here? <laughs> I have a bridge here because what the patient need, it's just an analogy to what, what, we are, what I just talked about, because what the patient need is a procedure. And the procedure usually belongs to another speciality. Again, belongs, air quotes here, um, because I don't believe any procedure belongs to anyone. It, uh, <laughs> like, like they say, the airway belongs to the patient, and the patient wants what is best for them. We need to deliver that. And most oftentimes, that's another, that is some other speciality who are expert at that specific thing to do. But if they cannot arrive in a, in a timely manner, in a timely manner um, usually because the condition is usually the condition that is too um, acute for the, we we're talking seconds to minutes here, then we need to like then we need to perform we need to be the binding element until this other speciality can arrive we need to begin the procedure um, and maybe even perform it all the way through that is the concept that's the essence of halo and i think it's a concept that most wouldn't agree uh, disagree on um, um, then it depends on which center you're working in where you uh, what your skill level is, and so on and so forth, how you practice these things. And I think we should practice these things. So if we do practice them, and we do know them, and we are the expert in the room at the time, and we know how to evaluate the uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria for, for that procedure, indications and contraindications, then then we should do it. And that is part of, that, that's kind of why I do this lecture. We need to know before going into the room when we need to do this. We need to have prepared ourselves to do this even before doing it, right? Because then we know the cues and we just go on autopilot once we need to do it, okay? That's why, because we don't have time to think in these situations. Yeah. As I said, most things in medicine are not that. If we have time from symptom onset, then the reversibility of the condition is, we have to wait for a long, most time, most conditions like blow over by themselves, but the ones that don't blow over by themselves, like sepsis, like the time until we need a um, an expert or you need a specific condition and you need an expert to do it, there will be plenty of time for the expert to arrive to do this. We need to, as emergency physicians, to um, diagnose the condition and maybe start treatment and then evaluate whether they need a surgeon for that specific thing or evaluate whether they need something else for that specific thing, right? Mm. And some of these procedures we may do because of convenience or because of agreement in local departments, but uh, like then we become the expert at it. But that doesn't necessarily, like, this is not what we're going to talk about today when we have to be take over certain, certain conditions. That's not what we, we're talking about today. What we're talking about today is these conditions where, where the, where we suspect, we, we there is a condition that the patient has, and we suspect that they, they have a halo condition, a high opportunity, low, uh, like, sorry, high acuity, low opportunity condition, which needs to be t dealt with within minutes, like, within two or three minutes. Now, we cannot, and if we wait for the expert. Then, like here, the, the expert we call the expert at that point, but the, the, the likelihood that the expert will arrive is like the, the sand is running out. The patient will not make it uh, most times. For instance, uh, one of the halo conditions is a intubation for the asthmatic who suddenly becomes unconscious. The Amax four algorithm, uh, which I've talked about in other lectures and. 
and I, I hope that you will uh, um, be familiarized with by now. Uh, if not, then check out those lectures <laughs> and and the references for the amex.com and emcases podcasts on the topic. But okay, so but what what we need there is that we have four minutes from when the patient becomes unconscious with asthmatic symptoms, whether it's anaphylaxis or asthma as the origin for the for the problems. Four minutes. So I don't know in your departments, but in my department. If I call the anesthesiologist, sometimes they may be uh, there in four minutes, and that would be all right. If I can get the call, if I can call them right now, and they come down right now, then this may be good. And then I'll tell them you, we have four minutes, and then I'll begin to prep all of the all the, all all of the things that they need. But most likely, we will not be able to do that. They will be somewhere. I'm, they might not take the call to begin with. There might be a delay of one or two minutes because just just calling them, and then they might say, "Oh, I'm in the elevator," or "I'm I'm in the." Like just giving the information takes too much time here. So we need to be the ones performing this. We still need to call them, but but make someone else call them and say we're beginning this procedure because we need to now. And and that's the, and and we will we may get like. <laughs> In this in this interval here, where like where there's like the expert is may arrive, but there's a low probability of of them arriving. This is what we'll get the problems for, right? We're doing probably doing a procedure that is not belonging, like again air quotes, not belonging to our uh, our speciality, like intubation in Scandinavia. That would be if I intubate a patient in the emergency room in Scandinavia, and I better be prepared for, to defend myself um, afterwards. And um, and the <laughs> the funny thing is, I can do a crike without problem because that's for all doctors. But I cannot do an intubation, and it kind of depends on what kind of situation it is, right? So if I evaluate as an expert emergency physician, not saying that I'm that, but if I am, then then I can say that okay, I saw this condition. This is what I had to do because I only had a few minutes to to work with, and I called the expert, and I did the procedure that I practice for. But and then I'm not, um, but that I'm not, I'm not doing every day, and that's why I'll get get a there will be a procedural hearing and all all these things afterwards. That's the thing with all of these halo procedures, you will get in trouble doing them oftentimes. And if you want support in how to deal with that, you can check out uh, John Hines's lecture because he talks about what what they call resource wank what he calls resource wankers. Um, it all, all depends, um, and 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 he 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 goes into details about it. I strongly recommend you to check out that lecture if you haven't already, to talk about like to, where he discusses what to do with all this like pushback that comes even before, but mainly afterwards once you're done in the procedure, because you need to do the procedure. That's the ethical thing to do for us as emergency physicians, even though. We will get in trouble doing it oftentimes. That's why Cliff Reed talks about how to be a hero. It's not about being a hero. It's about being brave in a situation where we are the ones that are the experts in the room. <clears throat> okay. There may be some conditions where, like, in, and that's why I'm talking about in certain Scandinavian contexts, there may be um, a, a role for more intubation by certain emergency physicians because... Um, the expert is further away. The time for an expert is further away. If you're at a rural center or if you're at nighttime, and, and it's like there is some wriggle room here. If you're at a city hospital where there's experts all the time, uh, then then you will not usually be be the one doing this because you will have an an eye doctor to do the lateral canthotomy at at at, at, at like at the hospital, um, and especially if it's daytime and yeah. But it may be busy and so on. There, there are different wiggle rooms factors here, but all of these halo conditions will almost certainly require you to do it now without the expert uh, being there, but mo mainly on the phone with an expert. Cliff Reed has uh, written this uh, article about this this concept, um, and I'll give you ref the reference in, in the next slide. It's uh, where he says, emergency physicians require competence in procedures which are required to preserve live limb viability or sight, and whose urgency cannot wait referral to another specialist. 
Okay, so that's what what we're talking about. And I hope I've I've pinned that point uh, now. And here's Cliff Reed in his lecture, "How to Be a Hero on Smack." Uh, go watch that; it's really inspirational and really good. And Cliff Reed is a uh, great, great lecturer and inspiration in this area. And and others, he's also done this zero point survey. And yeah, um, check him out. Um, so here's the um, article that he, that I was referring to before. And here's John Hines, uh, the late John Hines, sadly, um, and um, who is also inspirational in both lecturing and also being a human being and a doctor. He, in his lecture, talks about, are your intentions honorable? That is the main thing for us to consider. When Once we are skilled in doing it, we know when to perform it and the opportunity arise, then we need to not go into um, indication creep. We don't need to, like, oh, maybe we just, like, we perform it just because we want to perform it. Then our intentions are not honorable. Honorable intentions, as I understand it from Cliff Reed, uh, sorry, from John Hines, is that there is an indication. We are not afraid of doing it because we have practiced it and we are the expert in the room at the time and we cannot, ha- we, there, there can, there, there is no time for someone else to come. And I'm doing. Yes, I think it's a good thing to do. I, I think it's a fun thing to do. But I'm. I'm. The, my. The, my priority number one is that the patient is getting better. And he talks about if you have someone you prepped, you 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 are, you are, um, you are ready to go with the knife, and then suddenly the experts arrive in the room, and you don't have to do it anyway. Then you should not be sad. Or at least I, get, I understand this, where the sadness can, can come from, but this is you, you won't get this practice. Uh, like you will never be, get experience enough in this. So this is like a once in a lifetime thing. Don't wish ill on your patients. You, if I was the patient, I would rather the expert doing it than, than the emergency physician do it in other circumstances. It's only because of the really acutely circumstances that we need to do it. So if the expert, um, probably suddenly does arrive within the time frame, then give it to the expert. Then we should not be sad. That's the, that's, that's the thing about are your intentions honorable? We need to do it for the patient, not for us, not because we want to do a cool procedure. And um, another inspirational <laughs> character, uh, um, Simon, Professor Simon Crawley has, has put this into uh, a lecture called um, How You Felt. Uh, and he has. Uh, I've only linked the the YouTube uh, video here on uh, "Don't Forget the Bubbles," but he has a Saint Emlyn's podcast, a Saint Emlyn's blog on it as well. I think it's called the um, something about the paradox, yeah, the doctor patient paradox, maybe, or what, what we think is fun. So the, the essence is here, like, so the doctor may think something is fun, but the patient does not think it, and we need to keep this framework um, in in. In our back, back in the back of our minds when we're doing things, um, uh, sometimes being a bit cavalier about the things or being a bit um, cool about doing it can oftentimes um, induce um, calm in the patient. But we don't have to overdo it, and we should not wish ill on our patients. We don't wish us uh, for anyone to go through this procedure. But we, if we need to do it, we will do it. And it, he puts it like it's even more like on the point or on the nose if you think about it in children. So distraction, ooh, me, bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. Ketamine is awesome for me because then we then the patient sleeps and we can do the procedure and they wee and the, the, the care is wow. Um, but if you go into the, some of the more more halo kind of stuff, and then I, I might, we might go into the main mindset of oh I'm a god. I'm, I am the resurrection. The children will nearly be dead. This will be awful, right? Um, and the parents are like worthless in the corner. This is, this is, I, I think, yeah, this is just coming from another uh, guy uh, than John Hines saying this, like, are your intentions honorable before going into this? It's, it's, it's the main thing that we need to think about once we've practiced it. Okay. So which conditions are we talking about? And I've put it into a framework of A, a to E. 
Um, so it's Fona. Uh, if you take the A and B conditions, it's Fona, like front of neck, neck axis. I've done an entire video series on A. Uh, so check that out if you want to go through that. Um, we can talk about certain conditions such as the surgical inevitable airway, which Rich Levitan has coined, where you have such a problematic airway uh, that you will never get in with a boot you will never get you you might as well not attempt at doing an airway from above and you just go cut the neck right away that's the surgical inevitable airway usually uh, face smashing traumas or angular edema where the tongue is is obstructing everything um, otherwise you'll go through with the vortex method before going to fauna you can check that out in a separate video um, we talked about the AMAX-4 uh, with a, the suddenly unconscious asthma anaphylaxis patient where you have to intubate them right away. And you have to go through the AMAX-4 algorithm. You give them um, one, microgram, uh, my, my, one microgram per kilo of adrenaline. You intubate them right away without sedation. You, If you, if you have time uh, to optimize the conditions, you will try to... Uh, give them uh, rocuronium muscle muscle relaxant, and you'll do a, a few other things afterwards. But it's mainly adrenaline and intubation. That's the main things. And if the if you don't do um, uh, intubation right away, then you'll go to phona right away. All right. So um, your main your mindset here is um, suddenly unconscious patient with uh, uh, with airway symptoms in asthma or anaphylaxis. Then you will go to this algorithm, and then it's intubation or um, I mean, intubation and while you preparing preparing the intubation kit like you're already preparing this kit like, like what you call flying ahead of the plane when you see the patient is in a bad way you have this kit on 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 the in the room you have you prepare like what you call triple airway preparation so you have already the video laryngoscope the bushi and everything ready um, you have the anesthesiologist down with you if you have the time, unless it just happens right away suddenly, because this can suddenly deteriorate. That's not unrealistic. Um, and while you're doing that, you will also be uh, saying to another doctor, and a doctor once support comes, that they will grab the crack kit. And once you, if you don't succeed with the first pass. Uh, at a uh, intubation, then you, then they will cut the neck. That's like the everyone knows what they're doing. Doing that's why we do, why we need to treat, to treat these things in this um, or go through these things. Escherotomy um, uh, for burns. Um, I, I have place a star here, and I'll tell you why. Um, um, there are several stars here, and I haven't I haven't grabbed these out of my. Uh, my, my own imagination these are these are um a mix of co uh, procedures that uh, both cliff reed in his paper uh, talks about it, it, it's a um uh, that that the rcm book the resource um crisis manual from scott weingart talks about that where and where the usem core curriculum talks about the ones that are star marked is the ones that uh, are the ones that the core curriculum don't think that we as emergency physicians necessarily need to know um, depending on the conditions i'll show you what the wording the wording in the next slide but in general that's that's the um, that's the reason why they're like because in certain centers in europe you might be you might not need this but and you might it's, it's too rare for us to actually even practice it um and especially, especially if, it, like, if there, if it needs a lot of gear, and it's such a low likelihood of this happening, then, 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 there's a case to be made that we, even though it is a halo procedure with all the other criteria, maybe it's not worth knowing just that one, um, and that's that's something locally that we need to think about, if we need too much other stuff to. And it, it, it requires a lot of learning to actually even to be able to perform it. So, and and so that's why some of these are uh, star marked. I think burns are probably more more because it's not such a halo. It, it, sometimes it, sometimes it is, of course, but um, oftentimes you will have someone, a surgeon, or someone on the phone that could uh, could do it instead, uh, guide you uh, or or guide your surgeon. So, escherotomy is for the burn patient who suddenly has obstructive. A and B problems because of the burns. Um, they don't have to be circumferential. That's important. They can be um, just um, like 
if you if you put a um, imagine if you put uh, tweezers on on the side of your thorax on both both sides even though it's not so circumferential the, it can squeeze the skin, skin can squeeze in such a way that you're being tightened across the chest or the abdomen so that you can't breathe um, and the escherotomy is 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 cutting uh, in the sides uh, there's a specific pattern that you have to cut um, but it's not hard to memorize, but you need, you need to kind, kind of have someone on the phone to maybe uh, help you. And then you cut uh, until, it, I think, until it bleeds. Uh, you can hear it's not a, another thing I have in the front of my mind because it's really um, very unlikely for it to be something that the patient comes in with. It usually, it's not something that develops right away. It develops over time, a couple of hours after the burn. But it's potentially something that you need to know. Neonatal recess, I've done a video on this. And if you have a, someone giving birth in the parking lot, you need to know some kind of neonatal resource. And also I could say slash um, having, uh, having to deliver, um, uh, deliver a child um, vaginally um, in different positions. Like if you have a shoulder, a shoulder um, dystocia and how to do the uh, macropers and all of those uh, um, maneuvers could also be here. The um, for C conditions uh, are mainly usually the, these are cardiac arrest conditions, right? So you have a perimortem C section with the, the pregnant patient, and even though there's a star here, we I know we have had one in Stockholm the, uh, in the in the in the in past few years. We've had at least one I know of. Um, so it's it's definitely something that um, that we that is out there, and we need to know. Um, so that is a star that in my head is not something that should be a star. I, we, I think we should do this and we, I know we have done this, um, <clears throat> um, where we, if the patient and, and I just shortly, the, if the patient has, if a pregnant patient after week, I think it's 20 has a cardiac arrest, um, then the pressure on the vena cava. Um, we're already doing this, right? When we're pushing the uterus to the left um, during the cardiac resuscitation, or we are tipping the patient uh, 20 degrees to the left, um, more the uh, the former than the latter. Um, um, or the former is, is wiser now than the latter, I, I believe. But um, what we need to be doing there is within four minutes the child needs to get out and it's not waiting f the four minutes it's as fast as possible okay getting the child out so you need to cut um and if there is a gynecologist on in the room then great if not if they haven't arrived yet then you are the one cutting or the surgeon is the one cutting the one whoever is the expert in the room so you cut from um the um the side for it and down um, maybe um, do a little a little move around from the um, from the the, the 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 belly button because there is a lot of ligaments here it might be hard to cut through but you cut through and then you get into the abdomen you you pull all the tissue uh, um, uh, you lateralize all the tissue you have someone pulling if you have ever been to a c-section it's really you need a lot of pulling and then you have the uterus and once you once you get to the uterus you nick the uterus just just in the bottom with a knife um, you don't cut uh, with a knife through the uterus because you might cut the baby so you cut you make a small cut and then you grab a scissor and then you um, scissor all the way through from the bottom of the uterus to the top of the uterus and then you deliver the baby and then you go into a neonatal recess some other team has to do that so you have already called someone to do that and if you don't have a resource table, then go to EM cases to to uh, check out how to do resource on a neonatal without a resource table. They have a podcast on on the entire neonatal resuscitation, and you can use your only your own back metal mask um, with a fitted mask with, with a fitted neonatal mask on it. Okay. Um, so that's the that's the pyramidal C section, and then someone else has to take like once we're, 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 you're not doing like uh, you 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 can be doing the um, compressions at this at this time, uh, 
but the, and usually you can work on the belly while doing compressions. So compressions are going on here, right? And and then you will check for rest. You will check for all the other conditions, um, if uh, and so on. If it's a traumatic arrest, you will do all the things for traumatic arrests. Um, and if not, then you won't, right? Um, and the problem becomes if if you need to thrombolize these patients, then it's a huge problem, right? Because then you have a hole in, in your in your stomach, and it may be a pulmonary embolism. Yeah. So, but and we're doing it on the mom's condition uh, or indication, not the not the child's con uh, because um, mom, we want mom to survive for the child to be able to survive. Yeah. Then you have other conditions such as, such as the recessive thoracotomy, which are I believe a really uh, good start. Um, um, the indication, especially for the recessive thoracotomy, is sharp knife to the chest or sharp um, trauma to the chest or the box as they sometimes say in north america where you have the patient becoming unconscious in front of you that's the main indication there are some creep in that indication and i know sometimes in stockholm they will do it on blunt trauma as well um, and I, I know the evidence there is quite weak, uh, if even existing, but some an expert might do that, but you have to be an expert to do that, I believe. Our indication is mainly sharp violence, uh, sh sharp trauma in the box, meaning around the heart or in the central chest. And why are we doing a resuscitative, resuscitative thoracotomy? Well, um, we're doing it because we want to relieve um, relieve pneumothoraxes, we want to relieve a tamponade, and we want to put a hole, we want to um, put a finger in a hole in the heart. That's what we want to do. And then you have to go like, so what you do in, in the resuscitative, resuscitative thoracotomy is once the patient becomes unconscious and there hasn't gone too long, and a lot of these conditions, like you don't wait, you do it as fast as you can, even though it says within four minutes in pure modern C-section, and I, I believe within five or 10 minutes within resuscitative thoracotomy, you do it right away, right away. You don't wait. Once there are indication, you do it right away. And, um, but, you, but then there always comes a, comes a discussion of whether you should, should you do it once it's 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes, it depends, right? Cardiac arrest is not one thing. It depends on how long is the downtime been. Uh, downtime been. Um, are there other signs of good, like good condition? Like if you're in doubt, do it. As long as it's not playing around with a corpse, right? So it's it has you. You have to weigh that kind of. But 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 if if you would like that being done to yourself, uh, then then do it. I believe. Because it, there are several case studies saying, like for pure mortem C-section, that going on to I think 20 minutes, you have good results sometimes. Like the it's diminishing, uh, it's diminishing good results, but 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 there's there or there is lower likelihood likelihood of good results, but there are good results uh, to be found with, like until 20 minutes or something like that. So so do it, and um, yeah. The resuscitative thoracotomy, to do that, you can either do a lateral hole or you can do a clamshell. Uh, you need special uh, th uh, bone saws and um, special holding devices for doing this. Um, and that's why you need a system in your department for you to be able to do this even. And if you don't have that system, if you don't have that tray of these things, then you probably won't do it. Um, because before you've found all the things, the indication window has has run out, right? So, so you need to be prepared for doing this thing. Okay. Um, but in short, what you do is is you you cut uh, cut from from left to right uh, around the uh, fifth intercostal space, I believe, and then you uh, if you do the clamshell, then you cut with a knife, and then you uh, until the muscle, and you clip. Um, all the way to the middle, um, to the uh, sternum, and then you, um, with a bone saw, hack the sternum, or saw through the sternum, and then you connect with the other side where you might have done the same thing. And then you open up with with the um, uh, the handles. I, I don't know the names of those, but <laughs> like big handles where you where you pull the pull the chest. Uh, 
uh, lay, uh, up and, and, and down so that you can open and see, uh, see the heart of the lungs. And then you kind of, like Scott Weingart has an entire video where he goes through this, but then you go through with your hand under the lung, see if there's any blood there, open up, uh, and and then you uh, open, uh, then you nick the pericardium, see if there's any blood, and if there's any, and you birth the heart, I think they call it, because you push out the heart from uh, from the pericardium. And then you put a fin, then you then you kind of examine the heart to see on the backside and examine the entire heart to see if there's any holes in it. If there's a hole, then you either put a finger into the hole and then you call for help, or you suture it up, and then you continue with the resuscitation. But mainly, it's <laughs> finger in the hole, go to someone who knows what to do, and you have to stay there with the finger in the hole in the hole for a long time. Um, and you can go go and do intrathoracical. Um, compressions as well and there, yeah there's different things you can do there i think it's beyond the scope of what we can do in scandinavia in most centers um so i believe the star is appropriate think of thoracostomy i won't go into details too much with that but it's just doing a thoracostomy um but instead of putting the um instead of putting the, the tube in you just go in with your finger and feel that there's lung and then Okay, then you're in. You don't have to put the tube in because you relieve the tensor pneumothorax and you can relieve some of the blood. Then, you, then the drainage can come in afterwards. Um, no more, non-traumatic pericardial intensities uh, is also a procedure that we probably now best do ultrasound guided, guided where you go in with a needle with a attachment with an, an attached uh, syringe so that you know where you are and you, you can pull back on the syringe while you go in with the needle. Um, it's a long needle, a secalone, or or like something like that, a long long uh, PV like long line, um, something like that. You go in with that kind of needle, and then you pull back on the on the, on your syringe, and once you're in, uh, you 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 can see that there's either coming blood, or if you have the syringe filled with water, you can see that there are bubbles. Uh, if it's air, if you hit air, then that's your lung and pull back. <laughs> um, but if you hit, um, if you get blood, then then you're right. So that's kind of your feedback in that kind of system and situation. It's 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 you have to practice holding the ultrasound and the needle in the same time and pulling back. You might need several several hands for this. Okay, then you have the lateral canthotomy. I'll go through that in detail in the end of this, this lecture, so wait for that. And then you have the burr hole, and I don't want to go into details with how to do that, but in general, uh, the deteriorating epidural hematoma patient who has bleeding and are quickly deteriorating needs relief right now. And in my hospital, we don't do that. We need to get them to another hospital that may take an hour, an hour maybe, getting calling a ambulance getting the anesthesiologist in the ambulance, calling the center, saying that we're coming. Sometimes everything run, runs smoothly and everything clicks, maybe 20, 30 minutes. But I believe a lot of neurosurgeons, or at least at least one or two neurosurgeons that I've come across, both in lectures and also in personal life, would like us to do a burr hole instead. Especially if we have a CT scan confirming the uh, epidural, and the burr hole procedure is br like it's drilling a hole, like cutting cutting the scalp open with a knife, pulling the muscles um, of the of the the muscles apart, and then like burring, uh, like like drilling a hole with a special drill. And there are some articles out there uh, showing you how to do it with an interosseous needle, and then pulling out because it will be a small hole where you have to have a uh, um, high pressure <laughs> to, to get blood out but it's also doable that at least on an exper experimental level or a desperate level if you're a rural but in general this is something to go take to your department and ask should we do this because I think that this one is not mentioned in the USEM curriculum it doesn't even have a, like it's not mentioned and I think this is one of the procedures that maybe should go into the uh, curriculum okay um Amputation for extraction is one Cliff Reed mentions. It's only pre-hospital. I don't work pre-hospital, so I won't mention that. But if you have someone who who is is um, like you've seen the 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 film, uh, 127 days, I think it is. If if you're stuck and your limb is the only thing, mm, 
like m between you and and your life right then you have to cut off the limb to save your life to or to potentially save your life and that is the in, like that's the thing here and pre hospitalization sometimes you have to do that and that's a procedure that you need to know how to do if you work pre hospitally then I've, I've also put in my own here. I think takedown of the agitated patient is something that we don't have a lot, a lot of time for. Usually they might be really, really sick, hypoxic and, or likewise, or they might be like really violent. So we need to know how to do that in the ordered fashion. And oftentimes it's, I'd say, um, it's uh, 400 ketamine uh, or 200 S-ketamine intramuscularly. Um, in the thigh that works uh, that that's the like that's the, that's a dsi as scott weingart would say a delayed sequence intubation or induction uh, where the procedure is oxygenation and the um uh, th this thing is only being done to actually be able to save the patients and in sweden and in at least i think in denmark as well still uh, we we can we can have the nerve or um or um, the, and the law the law the law is different a little bit a little bit different in different countries but in like the essence is the same if the patient has a se severe condition and we don't know how to treat it or we don't know what it is and they seem in critical uh, they seem critically sick. We can take them down without psychiatric invo involvement to help them. That is our duty as a doctor um, to take the responsibility for the patient there. Um, and it's not always done. And 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 sometimes we involve psychi psychiatry, and that's not something that we should do. We just just you don't know when to do this. And there are certain conditions where we need to do this definitely. But oftentimes we can get help from, at least in my hospital, we get help from our colleagues uh, with sedation, um, with a patient who is agitated. Um, for instance, drug ag agitation, really like spitting and coming in with police and you cannot do anything on and then you have to sedate them because they might have a critical condition. Okay. Um, there's one condition here that sometimes is mentioned uh, in, the, in the resource crisis manual, which is penile Aspiration of the low flow uh, of the low flow priapism. I believe, as a man, I agree that is this is a uh, life and limb saving <laughs> procedure, uh, uh, and uh, maybe even eye saving if you count the one eyed snake. But it's kind of like <laughs> it's kind of like um, this is a procedure that may not be halo because it happens once in a while, at least once or twice in our hospital, but. Um, for if, uh, as a urologist, you see it a lot of times, I believe, in a year. So, for uh, but emergency physicians may not see it too often, and that's why it's a halo procedure for us. But oftentimes, the urologist will be there to pre perform the procedure, or you might have some surgeon to do it. So you may not be the expert in the room in that case, but something to also think about. But I haven't added it here. Okay, just wanted to show you the USM curriculum here. So um, this is a um, this is done by my friend uh, Eric Driver and um, uh, my other uh, <laughs> acquaintances. I would say we we do education together, me and Gregor, from time to time uh, with Eric, and also uh, Cornelia Hattel from Sweden. So we so this is this is their core curriculum uh, that they did in 2019. Um, and I've done a few comments on it, and and in general, it's a really good read to just like get it like this is what counts in 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 emergency medicine, what we need to know, um, and it's um, definitely a, a, a document that, that can be improved upon. So please write suggestions to the USM group if you have improvement uh, improvement suggestions, um, and get involved if you need if you want to. All right, but um, what uh, what they've done is that um, they, when it comes to procedures, then it's the wording is like this, um, and as I just wanted to show the star signs. So for each procedure, the physician should know the indication, contraindication, to be able to systematically and efficiently carry out the procedure, and know its potential complications, and know post-procedure management, especially also how to deal with the complications. Right? And when the procedure requires um, and, and so on, um, pharmacotherapy and so on. 
for each diagnostic test that's also a thing um, but that's probabilistic thinking and we have talked about at length at other in other lectures but here what's they say here's what they say about the procedures that are star marked so some procedures resuscitative thoracotomy or uh, for instance are potentially life-saving yet seldom indicated and for which finding uh, the mean uh, the means to achieve and maintain competence among all specialists in emergency medicine pro um, program is challenging same argument with intubation and so on uh, but there and if there's an expert in the room that it might be not not be something that we should do achieving and maintaining competence with these procedures is highly desirable yet not likely achievable for all specialists this is why for some countries and or doctors it might be ambivalent about whether to include these procedures within a core curriculum this includes a certain point of care ultrasound investigation uh this, this includes certain point of care ultrasound investigations as well as the ambivalent and the, this ambivalence is combined with an asterisk yeah so it's not only halo procedures it's all procedures but they um, but it's all oftentimes halo procedures that are mentioned with asterisks and i've mentioned the ones that in uh, that are asterisks uh, in in the previous uh, slide okay so how to train for the halo procedures how do we train for something that is rare that only occurs really rarely and this starts up the second part of the lecture about how to train for anything in emergency medicine because if we know how to train for this we know how to train for the other stuff as well so i've done a blog for, for uh, a long time ago uh, in danish about teaching and how, about all the theories on, t on teaching and st emlins are pioneers in emergency medicine in, in this field because they've done so much on teaching as well em cases as well has done a lot of you know, teaching so head to those um uh, has to those head to those references if you want to um, know more details about this but in general there are six um evidence like or in sorry in general before starting in general adults like we're taught in schools in a specific way but as we progress to adulthood and especially when we're in within our field of medicine or emergency medicine we we, we learn differently um, and there's lots of teaching theories that you might read on St. Emlyn's blogs about theories that we must know as, as clinicians as teachers um, and they go to go into details there but in, in essence case-based learning flipped classroom um, and some of these points are really good at in general in teaching so I'll just go through some of them um, you have spaced repetition and I'll show a slide uh, shortly about how, how that is, what that is then is retrieval practice so once you've read something and you've done your own like you've, you've done your own tables or you've done your own kind of framework for, for understanding that and you have chosen several different um, references to, to know that it, like hear the explanation from different people in different ways in podcast in video video format in 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 doing it yourself and so on once you've done all that um you will you will try retrieval practice don't look at your paper just kind of think of it because most of the things like to to consolidate it you need to like you need to consolidate it by by either saying it to yourself in your own words um if i used to say in in in, in, in like especially when learning anatomy like when I read something, I had to say it because I, if I couldn't say it even, then I would not be able to remember it. So you have to, you have to have, like, I've, I've always like when I, when once I've, I've read about something, um, then I sometimes take a walk and then I, then I explain it to myself or I explain it as if I'm explaining it to someone else. Maybe I, I don't know what if I have no evidence on this specific thing, but I usually do it in a different language as well. For instance, English or or Swedish <laughs> so so it's just to because I think it's, it, it focuses me more on the wording and and on, on this on the on like it, 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 it makes it more sharp I think for me but no matter what you do try to retrieve it like try to explain it to yourself in some way with your own words and you can then also do it with writing a sketch doing some kind of uh, sketching to to write it out to see like how do I understand and then go back to the thing like was it was it the same thing as you set out to to explain or whether were there holes somewhere and were if the if there if there were holes uh, can you like fill them in then you have dual coding that's what we're doing in, in when we do powerpoints in general um 
I haven't. I have another lecture where I've spoken in, in depth about dual coding and cognitive load theory and all of these other teaching theories. But and I'll reference it uh, later on. But in general, doing dual coding is just the concept of seeing pictures as, as along with words. So pay attention in books to to the pictures. Usually, uh, as an editor of a book myself, I, we would put in pictures. Uh, at the expense of other uh, stuff, so it's important. Like we we put in pictures because we think they are essential, um, and they say more than words. So words and pictures are important, um, and that's the power of PowerPoint and, or, or writing on a de on a on a um, blackboard, because we if we hear words and pictures, that's great. And and if you hear like legends of 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 of, um, of teaching like Ross Fisher and um, 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 I, oh, I forgot I forget Gary something Gar Gar Reynolds, um, you will you will hear that they will usually say that um, you shouldn't have put up words in slides because we can we can listen to words what I'm saying right now and we can look at pictures, but we can't read as well um but if you want so only pictures and words if you can um that's but that's that's the best interleaving means jumping between different topics you have the you have the figure down here instead of doing a b c a b c you can do a and then you do c and then you do b in general when you go to a topic then don't read from a to b but kind of get an overview to begin with and on the on the themes and uh, like starting reading a book, I log I always read the forward and the index, um, and then I kind of like okay, what is what is the, my purpose of reading this book? Why do I need to get this information? And then I can kind of sort what kind of information is the most essential and which is less essential. Then I'll often go read the most essential first, and then afterwards I can like <laughs> the uh, what you might call the um, the rule of of like uh, I forgot this one, but it, it's like diminishing, yeah, diminishing returns, right? So um, read the one, the stuff that is important first, get an overview to get the framework, and then you can go into reading the specifics, and then then the less uh, important topics can wait, or you can read them afterwards. Um, but also like jumping like an interleaving specific or jumping between topics, so you don't have to say okay, okay, I study for this, then I study, then I jump to another topic and then jump back to the other topic because then you kind of are doing space repetition and retrieval again, uh, uh, like in, in in while doing interleaving. Always has concrete examples. That's why that's why I always try to give examples when I'm explaining something, but it's because oftentimes words don't words are complex. And even the best explanation is not that good without examples. So do examples and do a lot of examples. We know it from the clinic that there are lots of nuances in different cases. So we need a lot of examples oftentimes to be able to understand something. And then you have something called elaboration, like um, explain, explain your ideas and, and as many details as possible. Like, And I will say that to begin with, explain it like just in, in the bigger concepts, but in once you've done that, then you can like go into details with certain things and why. Like then you can see the holes when you. Re I, I especially like doing that with, when I'm doing retrieval, uh, talking to myself or explaining the, on on a paper because then I can kind of fill in the gaps. And I would say once you've done all of this, you shouldn't have a detailed paper. You should have, like, a, like um, the more understanding you have of something, the less you have to usually explain, right? Because having a 20-step list is not good. You need five-step list you need to make it smart so that you can remember it um so uh, someone who's really great at that if you want a and we want to have an example and it, that is sarah Krager's icu edu dot um, com dot org i think um <laughs> uh, lecture site she has great lectures on 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 a lot of concepts and she's really great at this particular thing making things simple but not more simple than they have to be so yeah um and i always like to show this as well in the miller pyramid of the miller prism saying that well you know something well but and you know you might know of something but then you, and then the next step is knowing actually how to do it 
then it's then it's showing how to do it and then actually doing it. So there's lot of, there's levels in in doing doing something, and that's why we I'll show in the next slides that this is not enough for for helos. It's just knowing the theory and be, because you need to know how to do it in the situation right away, even though you have never done it before on a live patient. That's that takes a lot, and that's why it's so hard with these halo procedures, or potentially hard if you don't practice it. Okay. And I just promised you to show spaced repetition. And I like, because I think, again, a picture says more than a thousand words oftentimes. So if we think that we learn something now, and then after a, uh, some time, we forget it, and then we forget more, and then I guess it's not totally forgotten maybe, but it's at least it goes down a hill, right? But if we do, if we go down, then we, oh, now I re repeat it um, with a short time frame. I re repeat the thing, or I, I try to retrieve it tomorrow. And then you, I don't have to retrieve it too often because uh, the space the spaces ha can be further apart the more I've, more times I've done it, right? The more times I've um, learned about atrial fibrillation because that's always a thing that I have to look up. Um, but I, I'm, I'm getting more and more skilled at dealing with it as I'm practicing each each time, because and, and I don't have to look all the things up every time. I have to look specific things up every time. And some things may never like this, like the specific dosing sometimes or the specific something, like dates and numbers may sometimes sometimes vanish. But we don't need to remember everything. We need to know where to find it, right? So I have resources, cognitive aids. Um, that can just I know I know I go have to go through this guideline to, to do this and that, then I don't have to think about it right but I need to know what the indications are and how to treat it so so that's another thing we we, we shouldn't we shouldn't learn more than we need to either because, uh, in this situation we need to think smart we need to have strategies that are smart in the situation so that we don't need to have a 20 step guideline we need to know the five steps and we need to know where the guideline is. <laughs> All right. And the only things that we really need to know is the cues and diagnostics and the things that we cannot, we the halos. So we, do, we cannot, we don't have time to actually find out or find the guideline, right? That's where we need to know by heart. Okay. Then there's the concept of deliberate practice. And you may have heard it before. Um, you may have heard the thing about the 10,000 hour, hour rule. Um, popularized by a book um um i think was it called blink by a famous journalist i cannot remember his name but um he talked about the 10,000 hour rule and led if you're exp uh, and that and i might be misquoting here but uh, the popularized version version of it is well the beatles and violinists and all of those people that are expert or talented uh, they work for 10,000 hours before they can play their instrument but the, but Scott Weingart in his Weingart um, Pathway to Insanity and his Resus Wankers um, YouTube um, videos on, and Smack videos, he he will tell you that it's not about the you know, the amount of time. Of course, there's a there's an association between the amount of time that you do something and your skill level. But at some point, your if you start down here and then your skill level will plateau at some point and an expert a true expert might be way 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 up right so once you plateaued um, from just being exposed to something new then you need to think about what do i do now you cannot like you may plateau after 500 hours or maybe 20 hours and then it doesn't help you to do the 9800 hours more you will maybe slightly increase but not at all at the same pace as you would if you do deliberate practice so what is deliberate practice deliberate practice is often um, explained as if you I, i've played music um, not at all professionally but once you, if you play uh, music um, um, for instance a, a piano song or you play a um, um, a guitar song then you when you when you when you um, when you try to learn the um, the song on the on the instrument then you will play it to begin with um, and you may play it might play it slowly to begin with and then you then you begin to play it and then you may be able to play maybe 90 percent of it but if you're not 
but uh, but you if you just keep practicing just from a to b or from start to finish then you won't usually become much better at the 10 percent that were hard in the song right and it's usually the solos or the fillings uh, the fillers or something that is really hard in the song so you need to like think about what is it that is hard in the song what, what are the 10 percent that i don't know how to do how do i work that problem and once you once you know that problem then you just intensely tr uh, like tr practice those things and you may don't only have to practice it for 20 minutes each, each day and then go back and do something else interleaving so on and so forth and then come back retrieve, retrieve, retrieval right or repeated practice uh, 20 minutes each day is, is another book <laughs> about uh, learning um, but it's like you don't need to do it for a long time each day but you need to do it intensely like deep work right um, and once you've done that um, then you can then you can may maybe five percent only five percent of the song and so on and so forth and scott weingart talks about when we're doing a test or when we're sorry when we're doing a procedure we shouldn't we shouldn't um we shouldn't think about it as i can do the procedure we should think about it as i cannot fail the procedure right we need to practice to a point where we cannot fail the procedure and we not all of us are scott weingart right but uh, and uh, but and not all of us are doing dealing with that like intensely acutely population that he is dealing with but the intent is there certain procedures we need to know so well that we cannot fail that means that we'll, when doing like we i might have done a lumbar puncture a lot of times right I've, I've done lumbar punctures more than any other procedure almost because i've been in neurology and uh, i love doing the procedures often, often me who is getting cold uh, in the emergency department if i if, if someone cannot get it uh, get a lumbar puncture but so i've been i have a lot of exposure um and that might only get me to maybe let's say 70 percent of expertise let's say that um then uh, then i need to hone my like micro skills uh, like what are the 30 percent that i don't when i when i'm not getting it why am i not getting it well it might be because of the position of the needle it might be uh, it might be because because I, I of when i have really big patients i need a long needle sometimes i need um and sometimes it could be like micro skills as as scott wanker talks about like um it might not uh, once you once you've uh, once you put in the needle maybe you have to angle it just a little bit like um if you want to know about micro skills you can check out his lectures here i, I will reference them as well but my like from the 30 percent that i don't know i have to like practice and think about and 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 think about what is it that i don't know about these 30 percent and then practice that uh, mentally and and maybe even a simulation lab get a plan um, to what to do in the next the next time I, I meet this challenge and and then keep on going from there get someone else to film me um, get someone else to sit beside me do what you call shadow boxing uh, have an expert 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 doing it and uh, how to find an expert well read read um, some of the books are by um, Gary Klein an, an expert on experts <laughs> um, but in general, it's all about like if someone thinks if, if a group thinks someone is an expert, they probably are. Um, that doesn't mean they're infallible, but that just just means that they are they're less fallible than in other uh, other people, and they have mind mindware that are more sophisticated than, than than mine to these problems. So it's good to do shadow boxing on them. If you don't know what shadow boxing it is, please check out my other lecture. All right so so that is the deliberate practice right you do you plateau but if you want to keep going going from the plateau you need to keep practicing all right and it's all about feedback so feedback culture is also part of uh, feedback is also part of this uh, doing doing deliberate practice vulnerability loops so on i've talked about it uh, in earlier podcasts i won't go into details with it here but having a framework where you have an open mindset about the failure and, and learn culture instead of a blame culture is really important here and here was weingart's the path to insanity smack lecture that talks about these things as well okay here are some books 
on learning. Um, the, uh, the Peak book by Anders Ericsson, a Swedish-American, um, now deceased, sadly, um, and Robert Poole. Um, Thanks for the feedback by Dr. Stone and Sheila Heen, um, The Culture Code, and An Asteroid's Guide, Guide, uh, Guide to Life on Earth by Chris Hatfield and The Culture Code is Daniel Coyle. These are books that go through some of the like more softer but really important concepts uh, of learning, and some of them, like this is uh, this is, um, I picked these up during courses and during um, film people who likes these books and so on and so. This is a book that uh, M. Crit often talks about, uh, Weingart. This is a book that St. Emlins and uh, they like um, to talk about in their feedback course. These two books are something that are recommended by Cliff Reed in their course. So these are the concepts that we're all talking about. It's, it's for emergency physicians in, interested in this field of learning and in general just be, becoming expert. Uh, these are good books to read. And I think Cliff Reed wants everyone to read these books once they start uh, started at their place. So this goes into the del deliberate practice and micro skills. Check out the interviews from EM cases on this. Um, this goes this goes through through the three kinds of feedback, appreciation, coaching, and evaluation. Uh, uh, check out my other lectures on this. Um, spot the concept of spot the right that um, it's more the receiver than the giver of feedback that is important. That means I am the one who is important in this. I can if I only spot two percent of the right in this feedback, I can gain some two percent from that. And then I can accumulate that from time to time, right? Um, and then I, have, but I have to understand the feedback. Usually, I'm emotionally invested to begin with with someone who's giving me feedback in a different, in a in a bad time or a bad person who's giving or in a bad way. Then I might have an emotional response. But once that has settled, I need to go back and reflect, spot the right. That's kind of the essence. In a lot of, in, in short. <laughs> There are YouTube videos where Sheila Heen goes through these things. And St. Emlins has a lot of YouTube videos on on this and a lot of blogs on this. And they have a they had a course on it as well. The culture code is all about uh, three things: belonging, uh, like how to how to how to become an eff effective culture, and why it's important to make an effective culture to become a good team. Um, it's all about belonging, it's about psychological safety and feedback loops and vulnerability loops, and it's about priorities and cues um, so that the group knows what the priorities are and be keeps being reminded of those. But also here, this is all about feedback as well. Having a non-judgmental learning instead of blaming culture where we can say things to each other. And I, it's okay, I, I say I failed, especially if senior people say that, I, that they failed, then they create what we call an option for vulnerability loops where the group will say, oh, I can also make mistakes because the chief can make mistakes. Then we can talk about it, then we can learn from it, then we can become better, and then we can become deliberate practice instead of just exposure. That's, yeah. And then you have uh, the um, Chris Hatfield Bible here. It's, it's a great read for anyone. But it's um, Info Zero is one of the great concepts that he talks about. Um, he has an interview, if you don't want to read the book, he has a London Real interview uh, where he goes through all of the concepts or most of the concepts. This is the lecture that I've been talking about where I've, it's on in neurology, but I go into a lot of the like learning theory here as well. So you can check that out from my homepage if you want to know more about this. And then here's my blog about teaching theory uh, in, in six parts. Okay. That's a lot about learning in general, and I hope you learned a little bit about learning uh, just by that. But we'll go back to the main topic here again, halos, because we can do all of these things that I just talked about for halos. Um, but one of the main problems with halos are that they are infrequent. We cannot practice in patients. We cannot get exposure at all to patients because they only happen once every, like, once in a lifetime, usually, once in a career. So we have to use something else. We have to use visualization. And this is an incredible tool, not only for learning, but also for increasing your performance in different areas where this is really stressful, stressful and for preparation. 
Um, as Cliff Reed says in short here, in, in also in the article before mentioned, the rarity of the situation requiring these procedures requires that training should be re revisited on a regular basis at space repetition, preferably in the context of a local departmental stimulation in order to optimize equipment and teamwork preparation. And I'll go through in the end of this lecture how we do it in my department because I'm the co-head of, of that uh, or co-responsible of that uh, program. Okay, so how do we do visualization? Are we the only one who needs to do this? Well, pilots do a lot of this, right? They fly or they simulate, but, they, but this is what they do, right? But once they go home, they can do what you call armchair flying or what they, I think, call armchair flying. I have it from Martin Bromley, uh, who, is an, who is an expert in, in or who is really, really outspoken about these complex things about system problems in healthcare after the Eileen Bromley case, his late wife. Um, and you can hear him talk about this, among other, in Mastering Intensive Care podcast. But the problem is, like, we, we, we say... Flyers should, fly should train, trainers should fly. A lot of these things comes from the air, uh, uh, like the air industry. Um, and air armchair flying is taking a few minutes at home or on your bike towards, towards work or wherever you have time. And then think deeply about visualizing. How do, how do, we, how do we simulate this in our head so that, so that I can be in the situation even in, even in my living room? Or, or on my bike, and then try to perform th the things that we need to perform. That's visualization, because if we can perform it there, then we are in, then we are teaching like that's like, like that's like a sim lab in our head, and that's how that's one of the keys to becoming good at halos, All right? <clears throat> so, how do we armchair fly? Well. Check out so so there are these really good videos on it. Uh, I particularly like these t uh, two which I've highlighted here. The uh, Dan Dworkis uh, has a Dan Dworkis has a book and a podcast, but he also did, did this really really great lecture on how to visualize, um, not only for halos but in general. And here's the Scott Weingart Rob Orman um, uh, zero warning um, uh, podcast, which is also great about these things. But then Dworkis' four tips on how to visualize is, first of all, use multimodal cues to build a rich environment. So both external, meaning that um, you you have to think about what does the room look like? How are the auditory experience? What kind, where are your hands positioned? Are you standing on the right or the left of the patient? Um, see if you can find some instruments that are like the instruments that you're going to be using so you have tactile stimuli um, and you may even do the dance you may, may need to do what it, what is called Warren calls a, a kata um, you need to like imprint on in your in yourself what to do in the situation you need to do the movements and you need to stereotype the movements so that once you're in the room under pressure you can perform because once we come, become under pressure then our memory, the 20 steps, <laughs> fall, ap fall apart. We can only remember three or five or fewer. Um, but we get a better chance of remembering the, the essentials if, it's be if it becomes second nature to us. So that's why the motor kinetic things are really important here. Um, so we want to build this in our mental model, mental simulation. We want to build these, this ex a really rich external environment. Um, we can do this in our brain, or we can also like do it once, like in the in the like if I'm practicing for an emergency, in the, if I want to practice something that has to be done in the emergency department, I can go into the room early early in the morning and be in the same room, uh, and with some maybe sometimes the, the same noises, and then kind of do the procedure in my head there, or you can just I can do it at home armchair flying. And you can also, it's also good to have internal um, environments, right? Emotionally, emotional wise uh, and feeling wise. 
and we'll elaborate on that uh, later on. Um, but it, it, it can be both physical and emotional. So physical, maybe I have a high pulse usually. Um, so that, that means that I have to uh, get my pulse down somewhat. I, and then how can I do that? Well, I can breathe and, and have other um, tools to do that. Um, and oftentimes you can, if you want to simulate like stress inoculate, as you, as you call it, um, the physical, like being tachycardic, you can, while, while you're working out, you can, you can practice this in your head doing the lateral cathotomy or perimortem C-section while your pulse is up. Once you've done, just done your workout, that's a worry of doing it or while you're doing your workout, workout, right? Um, then you... So that's the physical one. The emotional one is more like thinking about what if it's a child, like, or being emotionally invested in the case. Like, try to go into the feelings of anxiety. Like, try to really mentally be there in the situation. Um, not saying it's easy, but yeah, um, because then you will get the same feelings. How to deal with those feelings ahead of time? Or oh, I, I will get anxious here. How can I like? How can I get tools to to go through that? So breathe uh, and other ways to do it. Breathe, talk, see, focus. That's one of the ways. Then we have to perform perform it in a detailed and accurate environment, meaning that it should be the same environment as we are going to, to practice in. And we we can start simple. We don't have to be in the simulation room. Or we don't have to be in the like. It doesn't have to be high. Res high resolution uh, and all of these things to begin with. To begin with, just simple scenario, just on a tabletop, and then think about uh, how to do it, uh, or in a, in a totally sterile room without any sound, without anything. And then you can add things as as uh, as you go along. Only add things that are realistic, right? Only th add things that that are uh, something that are going to happen in your environment, like. The sounds going off like people coming in sometimes you can't expect all of these things the reality beats your imagination sometimes but the use cases then uh, or from from friends uh, or colleagues um, and to to get like to get more and more levels into your simulation or on your 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 um your visualization your armchair flying Okay, then you leverage expert technical knowledge. And that's an important thing. You need to know what you're doing before you do it. If you practice something that is wrong, um, then then you're practicing, practicing something that is wrong. And then, then you shouldn't bring that to clinic, right? Um, so you need some kind of understanding. And if there's holes in your understanding before going in, then try to cover those bit holes. And if there's minor holes, that's what you find out during your... That's why we're practicing it. So then you, then you cover your holes... Go back to square one and try again and then see if there are more holes go back to square one. that's that's deliberate practice that's how we become better and better incrementally and then you can do what you call shadow boxing get someone um someone who is an expert to you see you doing it or see a video of you doing it or see you you and an expert can see a a, a common or some a third person's video uh doing a procedure and then Stop the video and then you'll ask, okay, what are you going to do with the patient now? Well, I'm going to do this and this and this. And then the expert will say, well, I'm going to go do this and this and this. And then you can sh like, then you can share um, why the expert will do what they do, what they would do, what are the cues that they looked for, and why uh, why have they come? Then why have they come to that conclusion that they have? And then oftentimes you can learn from the expert in that way. They can share their experience in that way. And then end all visualizations with a success. This is these are Dan Dorcas's four tips. So, and why end in and the success? Well, um, he he has the argument for it, uh, but in general, it's good to know, like, to prepare your mind that you're going to do to do good, because a lot of these things are scary ho uh, going in. So you need to build the confidence that you're actually able to practice it. So, so you need like while while you're doing your sim mental simulation, go all the way through and make it work so that it works. Mm -hmm. That's the 101. Now we add another level or another another layer to your the way you do it. Because there's the 201 here. Detail loadout. So you go step by step. And then you make once you go through in your head, then you then you make 
mental notes of where the um, simulation in your head becomes fussy or weak or you can't really visualize it properly. You may be doing a visualization in your head of a uh, tracheostomy, a tracheotomy, like a phona, front of the gas axis, and you kind of don't know what kind of size tube it is that you need to put in, or you don't know how far it has to go in, or how you actually feed back that to yourself. How do I, when, when, do, when do I know that it's in the correct spot? And, if, and, and oftentimes when you visualize these things, you'll just jump over, like you'll, you'll cut the neck, you'll get the thing in, you'll, uh, and so on. And then you'll, then you'll um, jump, then you'll skip the things. So you need to be mindful of what you're skipping, just as I just did when I just explained this really quick. I skipped some stuff. Why did I skip those things? Um, so I need to be aware while, while I'm simulating where the where the skips are or where the fussiness is or where I'm not high rest because I know when I'm standing with my knife I'm standing on the right side of the patient and I'm hold, holding it with my dominant hand and I'm uh, checking the laryngeal handshake um, and so on. That might be high, high resolution but certain things are not so high resolution when I'm thinking about it. Pick out those things and check out why th those are the 10 percent that are deliberate that we need to deliver li deliberate practice right those are the piano keys that are difficult those are the ones that we need to practice to become better so keep doing that and once you hit those things you can either go you can do one or two one of two things either you do the black box thing where you skip and then you read up it read up on it later like you keep doing your simulation and then you read up on it later you take a mental note of it or you don't pass go, you stop, and then you study it, and then you rerun it, integrate it into your model. Anything, each one is fine. So that's the first one, like trying to be mindful of where you're doing skips, and then trying to uh, like force yourself to become better at those uh, things that are skipped. And oftentimes, and then you'll find out, oh, it was a size seven tube here, okay, and then and and you and you have to go. Just cough. I'm watching the uh, the cough go into the neck, and um, I'm seeing that uh, the the cough is like when, just when the cough disappears out of view, then I'll and I'll blow it up, and then uh, then then that will be the placement, and so on. Yeah, so 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 that's how you you skip and uh, and read up later, or or you stop and, and study right now, and then integrate it. Okay, so the next extra technique is the pre-mortem and the pre-mortem is a thing uh, coined by Gary Klein uh, one of my favorite uh, favorites in this space as you might have noticed um, the author of shadow uh, of, of, of street lights and shadows um, and Gary Klein he talks about the pre-mortem um, which is in a usually in a group um, where you're doing a project then you'll do this drill where you say, and it has to be done in a specific way according to him, um, where you say it has, to, it has to be timed and, and there, has, there are certain criteria that has to be met and so on. But, but, but the concept can be taken to this field as well. So in his original version, it's like someone goes into the room where everyone is sitting and says, okay, the project has failed. And then they, it has to be this kind of surprise. It's a, it has failed. What is that? And then each each person writes down on their on a piece of paper um, as many reasons that they can find uh, find out or think of why this project has failed even before it actually failed, um, uh, before they even done the, the the project, right? And then the then you write it up, and then you can kind of agree or disagree on the, and then you discuss the, and then uh, the, the 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 pros and cons, and then you stop the drill. It has to be timed according to Gary Klein. So that's that's a way of of foreseeing failure, uh, um, and then learning from it, and then getting to success before, without even even doing any anything um, besides just thinking. And you can do the same thing um, in your head with visualization. So you cut the neck, something, and the patient doesn't really, um, you don't get in. Why don't you get in? Or like the phone had went wrong. Why did it went wrong for you? And then then, then then you can go back in your head and like, okay, what, what can it be? 
um, that went wrong, and then that, that's the drill that you can do. Okay, then you can pressurize the situation. That's what we talked about before. Situation inoculation is also called like going into a like it's, it's like being vaccinated for this from the stress that you're going to uh, receive once you're in the situation. And you can do it in several ways. You can there you can add stress emotionally or physically. And physically, to go go exercise and do all of these drills, visualization, then see if you can do it. Uh, that's going getting your pulse up and so on. So I do that a lot. <laughs> thinking about these things while I'm exercising. Um, you can do it emotionally as well. If you, then that's kind of harder. You have to be kind of in the moment. If, for instance, for me, if I have a, I have a child or I have two children and I have, I can do what you call stoic, uh, stoic, um, stoic and nihilistic uh, visualization exercises uh, where I think I hold my, that child in my arms uh, um, and and I really go into that kind of feeling and that's kind of a, like Scott Weingart, Weingart has talked about this in the smack lecture bar bills for brains I think it's called and our kettlebells for brains and and then you can kind of get into the mind mind space of, of this might be a child and and then you'll get emotionally more triggered and then you can do it even better uh, in the real life because you can never expect what kind of emotions are there. You can also practice what, what you call BTSF, um, be, uh, Beat the Stress Fool, or um, um, coined by Mike Loria and Scott Weingart, um, where you do, uh, you train some exercises where you can what do what you call left shift your curve, because we talk about this um, York Dotson curve, where performance is best when you are somewhat aroused, but not too much, not too little. And sometimes you will, in a stressful fishery situation, you will be out in the high end. And you have to sh left shift your curve <clears throat> to not have tunnel vision and to actually be able to perform and to not shift your pants if you're all the way out here. So um, how do you do that? Um, well, besides doing all the things that we just talked about, by visualizing and by practicing beforehand and by knowing the stuff, by that's why we do it. So that we don't start all the way out here, um, but we start maybe here. But we might still be here and we might be performing a bit better if we could go all the way here, all right? So how do we do that? Well, we... Um, we breathe and to begin with they recommended breathing in box breathing made meaning four breaths in holding for for four seconds and four breaths and then exhaling for four seconds and then holding for four seconds but in the rob arman scott weingart podcast now that they're even more um uh involved in this kind of thinking then then they've gone to say that they they, they are and they want to wanted to do longer exhales and inhales, um, and so so maybe inhalation of four seconds and holding, and then exhalation for uh, eight seconds, um, and then continuing that. They go through it in their breathing um, podcast in, on on stimulus, Rob Arman, and also in the episode that I just showed, episode I think 115. That's breathing. Breathing and seeing, that is visualization, that you do that beforehand, but you may, in this situation, kind of just go through the steps in your head. Uh, then talking, sometimes we all have some kind of negative thought running through our head, like, oh, I cannot do this, I've never done this. You may build up a, uh, a, um, a uh, habit of giving yourself a pat on the back mentally by turning on that voice of negativity in your head and instead saying, I've done this, I've trained for this, I can do this. Um, it may be difficult, but I can do this. And, and then maybe just thinking about next step. Not don't, don't think about the entire thing. Think about what you have to do right now, right in front of you. Just get, get the ball rolling. That's also a technique. Get the ball rolling. I'll do this. And then I can think about all the other things. That's also a technique, right? So I have to think, get the knife. Okay, I get the knife. Then I get the so so yeah. Sometimes you have to like <laughs> build it down like that. And Chris Hicks has talked a lot about this, like has a smack talk about um, getting complex things down to a simple structure. And you can check that out for more. Um, and then focus the B T S F. The F is focus. Um, focus would be try to um, 
in your mind's eye just have one like have, have one word before going in doing something and scott weingrass word is smooth before going into a procedure and he has trained himself to do that every time like conditioning um, every time he does the thing that is like that he can do then just just smooth and if you train that for all the non halo events then once a halo event uh, arrives he believes it uh, he believes and he has uh, he believes he has evidence for this as well um then then he, he will um then you will be conditioned to like okay i'm i'm in that m mindset i can do this so yeah get get your own word <laughs> i mainly myself i i do breathing um, sometimes I do the steps as well, but I, 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 I would not say I do the entire spectrum all the time at all times. Um, um, but it depends. It depends. And sometimes I, I think one of the main, main things is we need to realize that we are somewhere out here. That's oftentimes pr problematic for me, at least. Um, one, like during a shift or a really, really difficult case, sometimes we're out here and we don't realize it. So that's like another person called um, um, oh, I forget, but 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 uh, it'll come to me. But he, he, you you need to like stop and recover, and then like okay, I'm recovering. I know I'm I'm out here. I'm tunnel visioning. What can I do now? Jocko, yeah, Jocko Willink. Um, and his Jocko podcast and his book uh, Extreme Ownership talks about this: um, how to stop, recover, and then move on. These three steps. Okay. So that was the see the pressure inoculation, uh, the stretch inoculation thing. And then the last one is stumble and recover. I often sometimes call this the what ifs. But what if is like okay, so you get this case, and then uh, then then you go through the case, and then okay, now you can do that. What if it was a pregnant patient? What if this it was like this? That is that is one version of doing it, like elaborating on the case. But Dan Walker talks about that even that you even though you have to succeed all the time, sometimes you need to start from a point where you're stumbling, that, because that is like finding the, the deliberate practice ten percent in that song all right it's usually when we're stumbling we need we don't need to do this we need to know how not to fail and that's practicing the failure is important here so okay so so because if you know how to recover from all the failures potentially uh, potential failures um, listed in the pre-mortem <laughs> then you kind of know how to recover from each situation and if you suddenly should come up like uh, no if you should experience a situation where you haven't been before then the other techniques might help you right so okay so let's start with um, um you start your visual visualization with you've cut the neck but there's too much blood there's blood everywhere uh, and there's blood everywhere you don't have a suction right now this is where you start okay what do you do so you cut the neck and then oh there's blood everywhere then and then you and then you visualize okay blood everywhere blood in my clothes I can see blood and then then you maybe okay I, I turn my head I, I say to the nurse can you please get a suction a Yankauer suction and then they might say what the okay so Yankauer um, and I'll say okay just give me some towels so you have like a stepwise plan and then in your head again you have to end on success right when you visualizing this so you recover it stops bleeding. Even you can add steps. It can be difficult bleed, but it but it stops bleeding. You get the neck, and then you go in. You may you can also just just palpate with your fingers. That's what Scott Weingart says. Phona is a blind procedure, right? So, okay. So those are the four extras here, and that's how we how we how you can visualize and, and develop a habit of visualizing things. Um, I just wanted to show you the pet lab that's oftentimes in the literature as well. I think dent workers are better because they're more elaborate and they summarize everything that I also know about this area. But the pet lab is also good. Uh, the pet lab is um, uh, from the Loria, Mike Loria article. And it's just, you can read it yourself. But it's uh, same same things, uh, just showing you from different perspectives that this is usually what is being said if you want to be good at visualization. If you want an, ex uh, an external example of, of how to like how to do this in a really good way, then check out the Cracker 
Thyroid Immune Masterclass from EM Cases Summit from with, with Chris Kiefer. Um, you can it's it's on the Vimeo page of of um, of EM Cases uh, for free now. Um, but you can also go through the EM, EM Cases, the Crashing Anaphylaxis Amex Four Protocol patient. I think it's episode 189 or something like that. Um, and and check that out because it's it's a good lecture in and of itself. But it's a good way to like how do I train these um, visualize how how can I visualize a, a procedure and do it and practice it so I can do it. Okay. Okay. So the recipe for Halo is how do how do we as a system become good at it in a stepwise approach here? And this is my approach. This is my stepwise. Um, if I've never had a procedure that I have to do before, then I, I'll do like this or something like this. So first of all, knowledge. What are the, we need to know the knowledge. We need to know the procedure before actually doing it. What are the indications and contraindications? And usually these are really, really long. So I need to, I, I need to, need to like bundle it in a way so that I have cues that I like, what do I do in my everyday to be able to pick this up? I need it needs to be realistic. I need to be, be able to remember it, right? So, for instance, um, in the Swissem curriculum, there is a lumbar puncture, um, a lumbar puncture uh, uh, guide where it, where there's like ten contraindications. It's like bleeding, and then there's thrombocytopenia. And it's like, all right, but that can be done really easily. Uh, there's there are three contra contraindications because they can be accumulated to three things. Those ten. Contraindications. There's increased ICP, me and parenthesis, parenthesis seizures, um, cyclic vomiting, um, uh, low GCS. Right. That's ICP. That's that's that. Then there's bleeding, low thrombos like thrombocytopenia, um, uh, anticoagulation, and so on. And then there's infection at this uh, at the inside uh, in the, at the site. Right. Those three. That's how you kind of you can you don't know, only need to know the indications you need to not do it smart you need to be able to know it you just bundle it right in a way so that you can remember it and also the indications so for the lateral canthotomy for instance I don't have a um, pressure me measure um, device in my department I know how to use them but I don't have one and I will not get one so what do I do then? Well, the indications for me then for a lateral canthotomy would be traumatic patient with vision loss. Then I'll call the uh, call the um, the the um, uh, eye doctor and then I'll ask right away. This is a patient with low like a low vision and and uh, uh, like a, or, or decreased vision and and a trauma to the eye. What do I do? That that's one way of doing it. Like like you don't have, like simple like you need to be able to. Get the cues right, just like right when you're training in, in, in or working out. You need to like, oh, you don't have to like if you if you have the entire procedure in your head, then you, then you're not going to to know when when once you like where you have to um, uh, be able to uh, pick out like the data points. Oh, that's when I have to do it. Oh, that's when I have to do it. Um, you need to have the cue. So straighten your back or. Um, Feet towards the, uh, or, or like like heavy in your hands when you're doing deadlifts, for instance. You need to be heavy in your hands. You don't have to think think of all the details of, oh, I have to straighten my back and do all that. like. Oftentimes, the cues you can like, you can accumulate all of all sorts of advice in just one or a few or a few words. That's what you. That's the way I want to accumulate the knowledge once I have it. Then you do a step-by-step -step procedure list or something like that, and so you know what which kind of big steps there are, and you can always add the micro steps as sub steps later. It's really important that there aren't, aren't too many steps. You can again, you can accumulate a lot of the steps into a few steps, and most procedures don't take much more than three or five steps, or make them have only three or five steps because you will not be able to remember twenty steps. Then you have to think about what you need, what kind of gear you need, and it's important to we need to do so many things in different specialties or different sub specialties in emergency medicine. Have the same gear, having the same gear for most procedures is a, a winning ticket, right? So, so um, if you can, do it with just a suture kit. 
suture kit. You can do sutures with suture kit. You can do lateral canthotomy for suture kit, right? You can do uh, frontal neck access with most of the things in the suture kit. You can do perimortem section with with a suture kit, most of it, right? So there's a scissor, there's a knife. That's, that, that, that's what you need, right? That's, that is exactly what you need to do. Um, I think about these things. And if there are certain things that are so complex that need specific, specific things, uh, like resuscitative, resuscitative uh, thoracotomy, then you need to like plan ahead and have the things in a tray with its own name on it. Then you need to know the landmarks uh, and get them like kind of be able to see it in different patients. And then, then you can add what you call a kata, uh, and you can ch check out more about what a kata is in these, especially this lecture, but also in this lecture from Scott Weingart. In general, it's just once you once once you're hit in in a specific way in karate uh, or or other martial arts. I can't remember the specifics, but once you once once you hit like that, then you will parade in a specific way. Like it becomes second nature to you. And you may Scott Weinger uses the kata as an analogy to how to troubleshoot his airway um, handling. Right. So once you do intubation, you will do um, you will do a kata. I can remember not remember his entire kata, but it's like um, um, it's like um, neck, yeah, it's like neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. So it's like neck. Okay, I have to. Uh, if 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 I can. So the casa is used as a. Okay, once I go in um, with the linger scope and I don't get a, a good view, then I have. Then I do the kata. Uh, like neck, head, neck, head, hands, scoop, pull back. So that's neck. That means pushing on the neck, meaning it's by manual, um, not not burping, uh, not, not doing the burp, not doing the um, uh, crack rate pressure. It's a l pushing on the larynx to pull the um, pull the larynx uh, more posterior so that you can see better. Um, that will have, that, that's the neck. Head is lifting the head up. Um, or um, Neck, head, hands is uh, using the two hands to taking your hands from the from the um, from the neck of the patient and then now trying to uh, pull up while you're also saying to some uh, another person to keep the position like keep the keep the push on the neck while I'm pulling up with both hands on on the laryngoscope. So that's neck, head, hands. Scoop is a spe special move that you have to do with. Uh, I, I I think it's with normal uh, like video laryngoscopes. I can't remember that one. And pull back is if you're too far down. Uh, that's with with video laryng laryngoscopes. If you're too far down, you have what you call the Kovac sign. What he calls the Kovac sign, where you can see a laryngeal ring. Uh, then you you know you're too far in. You need to go and pull back a little bit. That's that's a way of like having troubleshooting built into a kata and i think it's really useful to have those things before that's like that's kind of the knowledge that you need to have so you have the indication the steps and then the troubleshooting if it goes wrong right in the form of a kata that's kind of the basics then you'll do um after that you you can start doing visualizations you can do it before that as well but um it'll be more effective the more of those the steps i just mentioned that are in there and you can visualize maybe you don't have to do it for 10 or 20 minutes, but you can do it a few minutes every day and then you'll become better. Mm -hmm. And once you improve, then you can do the, the 2.1 visualization things like, Oh, you're, you're fumbling or you're doing uh, like you can do the exercise while you do what exercising, or you can do a surprise question for a colleague. If you want to uh, teach someone else, like the Miller's pyramid, like how would you do this? And then, then okay, okay. What, what do I do? Okay. I do it like this. And then I do it like this. Good. So it's both about teaching and elaboration and all of those things that I, we have talked about. Doing it with colleagues is such a catalyst to doing it even better. Um, and then you can do the simulations, right? Then you can do mm, more specific simulations like uh, in a sim lab. Um, and I'll show you how to do how, how you, that could be done with, with a halo. And then you maybe will do it in patient care. And oftentimes we'll just... You know, the old phrase of see one, do one, teach one, or see one, do one, or see one, uh, YouTube one, uh, do one, teach one. That is 
okay for a lot of things, but it, it forgets all of the things that we just talked about. There's there's more, and you can do it at home before doing it in a more efficient way, right? So, um, so we shouldn't jump to patient care right away, but there's nothing like patient care. And we need to do, and that's the problem with the halos, is that we will never, never get the experience from patient care. The situation will be different uh, for, from two patients, right? So, um, so that's why we need to prepare it and try to think of all the eventualities beforehand. <clears throat> and oftentimes we can extra extrapolate like the setting from a lot of other things that we've seen, right? The chaos of an emergency room when it's going south so sideways. That's something that we can we know from from earlier experience, right? So Okay, then you then the the the, the last step is really important um, because once you've done all of this, you need to like um, have a system so that you will not skill decay. This is spaced repetition, right? And you then you can elaborate also building it in building building it into different cases. Like okay, you have a case where it's a trauma patient, but also they have to do thoracotomies, so they have to do pyramidal C section. We have a case in in the course I'm doing the instruction for, where we there's a pregnant patient coming in with a knife to the chest. Um, and then you have to think, okay, she's in cardiac arrest. You have to perform a pyramidal C-section right there and then because she has a stomach above the umbilicus, meaning more than 20 weeks, right? Um, she, you also have to um, do bilateral finger thoracostomies and maybe because she also has a tamponade if she doesn't receive ROSC from those two procedures you need to do a in the right setting of course in the right hospital you, but you, you could do a um, um, thoracotomy a uh, resuscitative, uh, re resuscitative uh, thoracotomy okay so yeah um so, so that's like incorporating several things in a sim lab into and how, how do you work that team? How do you work with the non-technical skills of that? That's a, what do we call a chaos scenario? And, but it's great to teach, but because there's like a trickle, uh, there's, there's a butterfly effect, uh, kind of like they, they, they go through, they can take the skills that they learn there to other uh, scenarios, right? So, okay. So let's, as an example here in the end, let's say lateral canthotomy here. So step one, we do the um, practice here. We, 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 you do the indication and, and, and the contraindications, and you may summarize them in, in a few ways. And then you have the like, in, like what, what are the symptoms? How do I, what are the cues that I, we need to, to think about? And then you, then you have the procedure here. And I would usually summarize this as there's no real contraindications for that procedure. Um, the indications are. Um, I can I can do it shorter than this in that I don't have a I cannot measure so it's like trauma with low vision uh, that's that's my cue then I have to think about it and then I can then I then I may have time may not have time to uh, think too much about it but then that's my cue that's when I have to think about it I don't think about all the other things I have, I have to be triggered first and that's trauma with low uh, visual acuity okay. Um, and then the procedure is, uh, I'll show you a better guide uh, in a little while here, but then I have to have this stepwise approach. Okay, I'll, I have to do the, um, I, um, once I have the indication, uh, then I'll call the, um, call the eye doctor uh, or, and, and get, some, get a tray with, or with a suture kit. Then I'll um, clamp the, um, uh, sorry, then I'll tranquilize the patient um, in the canthus. Then I will uh, clamp, and then I will, uh, then I will cut or scissor or like yeah, cut with a scissor or a knife, the lateral canthus, and then I'll go inferior, um, play with a guitar string uh, ligament, and see that it's there, and then I'll cut it, and then I'll, and then the, it's important, it's important like what is the feedback? How do I know if, if I'm there? Well, then I will. Um, and then I'll ask the doctor because I don't have anything to measure with. What will I do now? Okay, that's the, those are the things. Like that's kind of the procedure. Um, um, 
and w w I, 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 should I suspect uh, that the visual acuity comes back within a few minutes, then okay, that's what I'm going for. That's my feedback. And if I don't, then I, then I go into troubleshooting, right? Okay, if I don't get vision back, okay, what do I then do? I I cut upwards then with the dark with the eye doctor on the phone. Okay, that's that's the one thing I do. Then what if it bleeds so much that I can't see? What if they're on DOAC? Well, then I have to compress something. So I also have to have a compression in my kit. Okay, what if they are unconscious? They, they cannot say that they have vision loss. What do I do then? Well, um, then I have to have, if they look for other cues, right? Um, then it might have to be a visual cue of like the eyes popping out or there's a, there's a, um, on the CT scan, there's no bleed, but there's a pupil that is really uh, fixated. That's a harder thing to, to do, but, but that's what we have to think about as well. Um, what are the, what other other peri mortem or troubleshooting things could we think of? Well, um, let's see let's see what comes to mind. So and so, so on, and like you can go on like that and have a like a list of things. And you, if you're really advanced, I haven't done it for lateral can 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 thought of it, but you can do a kata, right, for the main problems that can be there. And so and what to do once you anticipate them, once you uh, once you get get there, right. Okay, um, I'll also have to, in, the, in this step one, I will watch videos of it. Uh, Larry Melick has amazing videos of live patients where they do stuff like this. Um, there's a lot of videos on YouTube, um, but, they have, but I don't, don't, do, don't use these videos uncritically. They might be doing bad stuff sometimes, so always have some kind of reference and, and check if, it's, if they're doing the right thing and see how you would do it in your department. That's the most important thing in this step. Don't, not how they will do it. Do you know where the stuff is in your department? And so on. And here's another picture of it. Like Anesthetize, use hemostats. That's only five steps as well. Like use scissors to incise this, the canthus. Incise the inferior crus. Remeasure. Um, and I cannot remeasure, so I have to do something else. Right? Exactly. This is, these incisions generally heal well and should not. So that's another thing. I, I I might be afraid to do it because I'm I'm afraid that they will be injured. Oh well, I shouldn't be. Um, I shouldn't be. If, and in statistically, I have to cut a few more than I'm actually saving. Right. That's kind of the, the, how it is within within medicine. If we're doing the exact right amount, then we're missing some. Okay. So now we kind of have the general picture so now you can armchair fly with me here so what do i do when i'm um, practicing this so i'm i'm i'm, I'm done an, i have an a, an eye in my in my mind and then i can go through the steps that i just uh, went through uh, with you guys and then I, i'll just uh, give you uh, i will i will not stop the video here <laughs> but but you can do it yourself and then you can go through the steps or you can go to Dan Dworkis' video and see how he's doing it while, while he do like he can guide you through a a um, another cantholysis, but he can guide you through uh, a phona uh, front and neck access, right? So so we practice we practice where all the things, um, and then we may once we get more advanced, we may add some of the like the clock and the and the uh, the timing the timing and pressure of it we may add the uh, the sounds the noise the smells of our emergency room and now we're there <laughs> okay and then we can add the other things then i can do it while i'm exercising and all the things and then we have can do the simulation step right and how do we do the simulation well we need to, we need a model um and um me and my friend found this model, um, and we. Um, but then you have to build it, right? So we um, we built this model here. This is my uh, good friend Emilia, um, and we at, at her at her place we, we we bought the stuff and we built this um, this little eye. And once you've done one, you can always do more. So we did this these four eyes. Um, I think we did five actually. Because we named them as well, you have to you have to have a bit of fun. So, um, the Bob the Cyclop, uh, Cyclop, um, Doris, um, Marty, as in Marty Feldman, and so on. 
you have to have a bit of fun with these things. And, uh, <laughs> and then we um, then we went to our teaching sessions, uh, which we have uh, three times a year, where we where we um, do a program on a themed uh, thing. And then, as part of the neurology thing this year, we we taught this to our uh, colleagues, um, my my uh, my fellow residents, uh, junior residents, and. And then we go through again, as we just did, indications, and they have to to do all the steps that we just talked about at home. And then once we get to the sim lab, they are prepared to do it. So we just quickly go through it here in, on the on the on the blackboard, the whiteboard here, and um, yeah, then they can do it. And as we see here, there is already a problem with the setup. Uh, you will not be sitting on the patient while you're performing this. I don't think so. So we should. Uh, they, one of the key things here was that we had to do it realistically, so we turned them around these papers because you will not be sitting there; you will be sitting, you will be doing this upside down, uh, most most probably, or you'll do them from the side, right? Depending on, but not from this view. Okay, and then you do the procedure: tranquilize, you go in, you cut, uh, you, uh, you, you tranquilize, you cut. And then you first go into the uh, the inferior cantus with a uh, with a tweezer and, and pull out and see if you if you can pull like or play the guitar string, and then you cut, and then uh, you have to somehow assess whether the pressure is good or not, or whether the lesion is coming back. And if not, then you cut upwards. And then it's patient care. I'm sorry, the steps are a bit messed up here. But this, then the next step is patient care, like getting it to the clinic. That's why we're practicing. So, um, and we um, not um, not too long ago, we 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 had this young man who had a blow to his eye uh, that came in, um, and he comes in in two minutes. What are you going to do now? Uh, he's ABC stable, but he might have a head injury. He might have some kind of vision loss, right? Um, and we were, we were told pre-hospital he had no vision. Uh, so what do we do? Well, we um, we get the tr get the get the tray, or at least in our mind we know where it is. The suture set. We prepare, right? And then we all we don't forget the ABCs. This is uh, and when we don't get to annoyed if it's if it's not today we're doing it and it wasn't today that we had to do it because um, this is not his eye but it turned out that he uh, sadly had a open globe uh, which is not something that we can save um, and um, but we can avoid pushing it on pushing on it and then get him to an eye doctor that who may be able to save it save it okay that's why we're doing these things because we might end up in the care like we, we do have these cases uh, from time to time where we have to think about it and once we've thought about it then we know how to do it we know the cues and then we know when we have to be prepared for it so it's and it's encouraging and it is become making us experts i'm not saying we should put all our eggs in the basket of halos we need to do this with the basic procedures as well um and the standard procedures and but the halo is a good example of how this can like trickle down and become a a a, a um, positive feedback loop of expertise and teaching and yeah as a good just um yeah it's just a good way of doing it and then, then i'll just last couple of minutes here spend a bit bit of time on the improvement of skill uh, pr how to improve uh once we've done things in patients and, or how to resist skill decays because we need to have a system here. We take all of the USIM, USIM stuff and we take the um, all of the differential diagnosis that we need to know as emergency physicians and we need to and we do and take all the non-technical skills and then we want to have a framework of cases and simulation because we know that's a good way of um, teaching and then flipped classrooms and then maybe a few small lectures and we also need to fit in some admin sometimes in these educational weeks then we then we then we make a system then we when we make um which is anchored in the, in the core curriculum we we would make maybe 20 weeks uh, where we through in residency um, of five years we'll go through all of these maybe twice right so um let's see uh, let's say it's three weeks each year and uh, means times five 
uh, five years of residency. That means each resident will go through these themes five, like like have 15 weeks. And 15 weeks, um, if we do, maybe depends. Like if we do two or three of these each time, then we'll go through. Then 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 the emergency physician resident will go through these three times a year. Oh, sorry, three times, two times, or at, at least once but maybe two times during the residency. And that's great, right? That's that's the system, right? And then you, then you, with your scheduling people, get some time to, to do this because you have to, that you have to be allied with them and uh, they have to see the purpose of this. Um, and it's sometimes hard to convince because it's a long play. It's not a short play, it's a long play, this. And it's time away from clinic for a lot of people, and that's hard to convince your people about. But they need to know, and you can show them this video on why it's so important. But so during the this is a year cycle, if you if it wasn't clear. <laughs> <coughs> so winter, uh, spring, summer, and autumn, and so you might have a week here. This week we'll be doing a neuro theme and eye theme and. Uh, talks or um, altered mental, mental status theme, and then it fits really good with, with lateral confotomy. We we know that that's one of the procedures that we need to do. We need to add a few in, in, in a few more. We we recently did lumbar puncture with lateral confotomy, and then we then we have that, and then that's that what that week. Then we have week another week, and and so on, and then we can plan the entire year like that, right in themes. And uh, we can do the uh, uh, and uh, and <laughs> optimally after one of these week I can I can do a video on them because then I can teach others about how to do this like this is really meta but that's what I'm doing right now, right? And then the concept that we're using me and Amelia and, and Nick we're doing what you call the flipped classroom because we know that people are not being taught. Um, like we learn in different ways than we did when we were children. We don't want long lectures. We could do that, but we can do that at home. We can see there's lot, lots of good long lectures at home, and we need to do podcast. You need to go go through podcasts and something something you have to read and so on. Um, so so we need to everything has to be read at home so that once you come to the week. We can effectively do simulations and cases and all sorts of things and build on the theory instead of explaining the theory. Because explaining the theory is too low a level. We need to do the theory. We need to get the theory in practice, right? We need to get them through cases and simulations. That's where we learn. Okay, and I just wanted to show you one of these schedules that we, that we have, um, because I know some of you have been interested in interested in our educational weeks and how we do it. So we get these we get three weeks each year. <clears throat> um, we have so many residents in our department that we have to have three times two, meaning that half the residency um, half the residents go on one week and the no another one goes on the next week, and we like so the the, two, the weeks are paired. Um, so this uh, it might have been like last year it was I think week five and eight and then it was twelve and sixteen and then it was forty and forty five something like that um, and then we have a theme per per um, like educational pair week so um, and 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 then there was five days so we we add a lot of stuff in there so. Um, the day one and day two are generally where we do journal clubs on the theme. So, for instance, this, are, this is the neuro, the neurology theme, uh, the neurotox altered an eye theme that we had. Um, we do a journal club. I just uh, posted the, uh, the the lecture on that, called um, about the prisms study, and about the thrombolysis, and uh, and we get we get lectures as well. I, I asked in like some of my friends and colleagues. Uh, from neurology, from my time in neurology, to talk about stroke from their point of view and the dizziness and how we can collaborate. So it becomes a collaboration thing and a tribalism thing. We, we can we can break down the walls between between the departments. So that's even a, a better thing with this, right? Um, <clears throat> and then on, and then, so that's the two first days, right? And it's like like a common day for for the for the um, for the groups, and, and then. Um, 
then once they don't have any program, then they will do reading if they haven't read already. Then we'll do the reading and then the, I'll show the reading list uh, that I um, wanted them to read. And they might do other admin stuff. Sometimes our boss will come and have a lecture or a or a um, or a um, workshop where we will try to improve other things going on in the department and talk about those. Uh, last time, for instance, we talked about um, we talked about what we um, like the, the 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 we have a um, a, uh, a questionnaire every every year where they go out and they, we 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 measure up against other clinics and other. Uh, emergency departments and then they, we, we talked about what we could do to become better at certain points and what we're doing good and so on so there's a feedback in there that's really really valuable as well we did a um, meeting a residency meeting where we talked about what we could become better at and what there's problems with and so on education wise um, <clears throat> union wise and so on it's great those are the first two days then I and Emilia and sometimes Nick uh, stands for the the, th the three last days um, where we have um, differential diagnosis uh, in one of the days usually um, maybe a small lecture but m like what we do what you call diffal um, in Swedish we do prospective cases in probabilistic fashion on different themes where you have maybe oh you have a diplopia patient um, who is this old who has this kind of maples and opqrst what are you going to do um, and then we talk about talk about probabilistics and it's great it's really really great and we could also do communication here we could do everything we want to here, uh, here. <clears throat> um, and then the, on the last two days because we got feedback from the uh, couple of last couple of times we've done it they wanted more and more they wanted one more simulation so we try to put in as much simulation as possible in these weeks um again flip classroom no lectures just straight on the sim simulation and um procedures right so um that's what we do on day one and day two and um yeah that's where you had the pictures from on the lateral conthotomy <clears throat> And then we'll do it on both days, but uh, one day with team one and one day with team two. That's more logistics, depending on your department, right? And beforehand, uh, there's a, we we send out a, a letter. Uh, you can read it in Swedish, but in general, this is a theme we're going to do right now. Um, you have a pretest from you can add you, you can go to Lucem's L U C E M's page homepage. And there's free pretests for the Swedish curriculum. Um, we don't use that too much because I pref they're they're a bit dated, and I it's our driver who's made them. They're sort of really well made, but they're a bit dated, I think. And I think they're only written and they take long, long time. So I think it's better invested to just give them some links from different from different um, sources in the FOMED world. <clears throat> and it's important that they have both podcasts and videos and something that they can watch, um, and because. Uh, if they have that, um, you learn in different ways, first of all, and you you may not have time to read everything, but you might have time to listen while you're doing the dishes or you, you have small children while, while you're working out or whatever. That's that's the power of doing learning uh, in different ways. So uh, you may have quizzes as well, um, but that's something that we do in the, during the week instead. And then we'll say like sometimes we have new residents or we have new people uh, who hasn't been through the main theory, like probabilistic theory. And then we'll add, I, I've done these lectures on my homepage here. We may uh, do a f like a small lecture once we have a lot of people who are new. Then we might do a, group them together and do a lecture uh, and go a bit slower with those, that group. But in general, just being aware that we are doing a theme and this theme is 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 part of the what you call uh, the Swedish curriculum and the Swedish curriculum is part of what is the USM curriculum so it's all kind of like it's all the same system so we like and this is this is a really really good way of, of doing education because there's a connection there's a red thread uh, in between everything we believe in this uh, at least and I don't get any money for promoting this I just wanted to put it out there this is one way to do this how uh, to teach in a um, how to do formal teaching not to forget there's also informal teaching in the everyday I haven't gone into that there's an EMK's podcast about uh, teaching on shift it's, it's great um, do check that out 
Um, and I think that's actually even more important almost, but, but this is, is really, really important because this, if you can go do, do this and use this as an example, then we get a culture and a language that we use in the morning meetings that we can do cases and with the same framework just quickly. And like, and this makes everything be together, right? It makes everything connect. And even though the, the 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 leaders of our department may not see the effects right away, we feel them and we feel proud of it while we're doing it. And our we, the feedback we've gotten are is excellent so far. And you can um, and we it's not always, but we are like we are open to feedback and we will try to change. And if we if we don't like it, then then we'll don't, then we'll not do it. We use a lot of free time doing it. Um, and we tried, we, we through, through our, <clears throat> through my experience as, as an instructor and as a teacher for, for a while, we, we tried to <clears throat> come up with the best methods and come up to come up with this. And we borrowed the program, like the, the, a lot of the cases and the simulation things from, from, from Eric driver. And we, we thank him a lot for that. So, and, but, but you can build on it yourself as well. So you can do this in your department as well. And I hope you will do. And you can contact me if you want details. And um, I just, yeah, hope you will continue to um, make your department and the patient experience a better place. Um, and it doesn't have to be, as I said, it doesn't have to be cases and simulation. It can also be communication, compassionate care, overdiagnosis, all these things. You can put all in all these important things that I've also also done lectures on into this these weeks uh, and have themes on that as well. Just wanted to show you the, le the letter that we sent out. Besides that text we just uh, showed you, uh, then I usually do a, a prior uh, prioritization of the of the um, of the stuff that they need to read. So um, red is need to know. I, I recommend that they read this unless they know it already. Yellow is nice to know and green is for interested people. And this is the first page of the journal club here, here. Here's like, you can, here's some of the background information about that. Here's the, um, like a blog who has got, actually gone through it. We'll be talking about it, but, but if they don't, we're not trying to trick people here. We're trying to make them learn, right? So, so if they don't have time to read it or whatever they forgot, or, and then they can be part of this conversation if they if they use this Fus Club or the these um, these home pages, right? So that's why I put it in, put it in there. And for the the rest of the week is like okay, neurological basic stuff. More of and there's like a long list. They're like it's like two pages more here, but then I have different links. This is my video on basic neurology, uh, which I think is essential if or, or something likewise like this. And there's. Um, uh, the SMAC lecture and I, I do these lists and uh, like um, you need to be able to do these lists but they don't have to be so elaborate <clears throat> and if you contact me you can get these lists as well if you want to for your department um, uh, they're based in Sweden now but but uh, you can do it in Denmark as well with a few tweaks uh, and everywhere else so um, right and, the, and the, the principles that I talked about is flipped classroom, multimodality, you need podcast notes, reading, and videos. <clears throat> you have to fly as you train, train as you fly, meaning that the setup in your simulation lab should be the same as in your clinic because you're doing this to become better in your clinic, in your own clinic, right? You do themed weeks um, and you need to do them in a year reel so that you have um this you, you know you, you kind of have to do the dirty work of knowing what what is important what is the core curriculum says what's the procedures then you have to share it into or, or you have to deal it into maybe 20 different themes and then you have to pair the different themes and then you have the themes spattered over the residency um in different weeks and you have to bring it to clinic, use it in the morning meetings. Like it's something that it has to be based on the theory. It has to, doesn't have to be pie in the sky stuff. It's something that it has to be, we know we need to like, this is how we come, become better in practice. It has to be something that is relevant for us. It has to build on, uh, we think it has to be built on, on probabilistic thinking and non-technical skills. Um, that is important and really, really important with, both during simulation, but also during um, the entire process, 
feedback, learn, not blame culture, and psychiatric, uh, psycho psychological safety. Meaning that we don't, um, it's not an evaluation of people, it's it's to learn. And it's this is where you, this is a safe space where you can make mistakes. And But we will coach you on, on what you, on the mistakes you make. And we all make mistakes. I do it as well as you, vulnerability loops, right? So that that's just some of the concepts. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you found this useful and, and both when, when it comes to halos, the concept of when we are actually needing to doing the, the halo procedure and what why it is so important for us to know about this concept and how we can learn from the halo um, how to kind of teach in the best way. And, and I gave an example of how to teach in the best way here in the end. Um, so thank you so much and um, bye bye.